So when you're learning, you know, the basics of algorithmic uh, models, now you'll have to confront questions of algorithmic bias and fairness. It won't be, if you're interested in that, go take the class in the philosophy department. It will be built into the core classes in CS. witnessing some of the, uh, the harm and damage being made by the adoption yes. of the algorithms and AI and like the and biases that exist in some of the tools and the spread of disinformation yes. and, and distrust in the media and all of that. To deal with that potential threat and harm, like who do you think is most important to be educated and like will informed consumers be most critical or informed developers or informed government? Well, I think all of the above is important. And at the end of the day, I wouldn't leave this just to consumers, however, because that's a kind of one by one approach that doesn't leave possible a kind of broader or collective strategy. So, you know, some people say they're so fed up with Facebook that the only responsible thing to do is to delete Facebook from your phone or your smartphone is so filled with notification devices and various ways to hack your attention that you should be you know, like turn the color off and make it grayscale and be like that's the power of a consumer if that's the sum total of our kind of possible actions I, I think human beings are going to lose out in the end. I'll give you just one example in the space of say, you know, content moderation or content regulation, what I have in mind. So in the United States, when you used to be able to go to a movie theater, the movies are all rated, you know, G or PG or R, or no content. That is not a law that was passed by the US government. It's a voluntary industry collaboration to self-regulate and to give information to consumers so they can make informed decisions about whether or not they wish to allow their children to see a movie or if it's rated R, there's an age cutoff. That's an example that sits above the consumer and is below the government. So that's, I wanna emphasize, our choices are not just let the individual user decide or let government regulate. We have lots of other options in between. One of the great things about being at a university is that we get to teach 19, 20, 21 year old kids. And these are the kids that are gonna end up in 10 years in positions of leadership and responsibility. So we can think actually about how do we wanna educate people for the next 10 years so that 30 years from now, the world looks like a different place. I mean, I think it's a great transition to your ethics curriculum that you're yep. studying campus. I can you tell us about the new curriculum, how you're adopting it, and is there any early wins that you have witnessed? Well, um, we're doing a bunch of really exciting things, much of it driven by HAI style thinking and with support from people like you. So um, I'm really excited about two different efforts that complement each other. One is what we call embedded ethics. And the idea is not to tell the computer science professor who doesn't have the kind of philosophical training to include genuinely robust content in ethics in his or her courses, but now working in collaboration with someone who does have that training, we're developing modules for each of the core courses um, that will expose every single student at Stanford who's a CS major to ethical frameworks and ethical questions about AI and you know, computer science more, more broadly. So when you're learning you know, the basics of algorithmic models, now you'll have to confront questions of algorithmic bias and fairness. It will be built into the core classes in CS. Now, there's a second initiative, and this is one that I'm also personally involved in, which is um, a large introductory course 
And the large introductory course combines me, the philosopher, a colleague who's a social scientist that has experience in public policy, and then a computer science professor. So this is the only course we know, at Stanford at least, that combines technical assignments, policy memos, and philosophy papers in the same class. So we wanted to make this a large class. It enrolls about 300 people. Right. That's great. I mean, I think that's wonderful that Stanford has adopted that curriculum and offer it to the young students. So those are available, those learnings and curriculum are available for- Yes, that's, that all the materials are, are Creative Commons licensed and they'll be assembled on a website together. The website for the class I just described is cs182.stanford.edu. You can download all the case studies, all of the readings, as long as they're not copyrighted. And, you know, similar for the modules that we're developing in the Embedded Ethics Initiative. We would love for other people to use them in their company, at their other universities. Um, they're meant for, for everybody. A corollary to that, we don't necessarily exercise everything we learned in kindergarten. Are you hopeful that those who took those courses and lessons will practice what they learned throughout their career? Yeah, that's a great question. I have to remind people that there are at least three different levels of thinking about ethics. And the first level and the least interesting level, to me at least, is personal ethics. Human beings are imperfect. Almost no one is a moral saint. We all suffer from various flaws. And so the goal for us shouldn't be that we need an ethics course as if it's a kind of like a vaccine against future bad behavior. Much more interesting are a second level and a third level of ethics. The second level is professional ethics. What are the professional norms and structures that should bind people together in their professional activity? Now, the classic one is, you know, doctors or, or medical healthcare providers who have the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm, plus a whole set of other norms that guide their own practice. Um, I think we could develop a much broader set of professional norms for AI scientists, um, and that would be a, a good contribution. And then, of course, the, the final level, the third level, is political or social ethics. How should we think about the institutions that shape our own behavior, and how do we design better institutions so that whatever human behavior is, it's channeled in general to a better direction? Yeah, we all knew that you shouldn't lie, cheat, or steal. Don't be Lance Armstrong, the Olympic bicyclist, or the you know the Tour de France winner who doped himself in order to win. Don't be Elizabeth Holmes, the Stanford dropout who created Theranos, but was deceiving people about the power of the technology. We don't need ethics classes to tell people don't lie, cheat, or steal. If, if you didn't learn that by the time you showed up to Stanford, it's already too late. What we need are ethics classes at a level of institutional arrangements and confronting value trade-offs and tensions, the kinds of things which are part and parcel of any responsible person's life. Fantastic. Thank you so much again for your time and sharing your thoughts. I so hope we can do this in person at some point in the future. Wouldn't that be nice? I'd love to meet people, uh, you know, in your part of the world and have conversations as well. And would love to welcome um, anyone here to campus in the future too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great, super, thank you so much, Songyi.